It's time. We you know, we waited a long time for it, but I think we can we can officially now say that the Mason Rudolph era of the Pittsburgh Steelers, like I mean, six more Super Bowls, it's coming. They they told us when they drafted him, like he needs to ride the bench, he needs time. Uh and and I think it's finally it only time. Took six years. Yeah. It only took you know it's crazy. I think one of the funniest things about Mason Rudolph being named the starter is like you just like how quickly he was a story like five years ago, six, uh, four years ago. And now he's yeah, been like a non-story yeah. for like three years where you haven't had to say his name or think about him. And now all of a sudden it's like, crap, not only do I have to think about him, I got to watch him on national TV on Thursday. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> this is where we're at. Uh, in the NFL, NFL season with uh, quarterbacks. Wild. Whew. Dude, it, it, it's it's very brutal. Very we got brutal. a Jacoby yeah, Brissett game. We did. We did. We got we saw Jacoby Brissett out there on the field. Um we're potentially um, uh, you know, gonna see a couple more games of Easton stick and, and we're one injury away from yet another quarterback being yep. inserted into the mix in that uh in that game. Uh yeah. Jalen Hurts was also like questionable for tonight. Yes, I don't know Marcus- if he is We'll have to check that. I haven't seen any text. I, or, I'm uh, pretty like, sure he's a go. Through. I'm pretty sure he's a go from what I saw. The betting lines is that they haven't changed yet, but I thought it could still be a game time division. It's been crazy. And I don't know if this is a, just an, a, a total off year, but it feels like it's just the way it goes because teams are the way they salvage. Like, Oh, can I stick my, say my job is like, Oh, throw a rookie in there. And if he plays well, then then maybe that I'll, I'll keep my job. You know what I mean? Yeah. A lot of times it's worst case scenario and it's, it's a, uh, it's a, a no lose situation. It's like, we're already backs against the wall. Might as well see if we have someone here that can create a spark and uh, can do something fun for us. But no, it's been a lot of quarterback play this year. And we've talked about the injuries. It, it probably isn't in terms of number wise, any different than a normal year, but in terms of the injuries to star players, uh, you know, I don't have the stats on that, but it certainly feels like an anomaly in that regard. We have seen so many different quarterbacks, so many different running backs and uh, and wide receivers at that, just to name a few, uh, not even counting any defensive players and stuff that have had to be uh, swapped out due to injury this year. So it's been wild. It's it's a crazy run. And uh, week 15 did not disappoint, Mark. Uh, it did disappoint some fan bases, that's for sure. But the fail Mary. You know, this uh, that's yeah, good lord, man. We'll we'll have to talk about that uh, with uh, with that right in the breadbasket. It's about as close as an, of an opportunity as you get uh, in this league. But tough play to make. Uh, the the story of that was the Bears blowing it once again, uh, unfortunately, with the with the grasp in their hand. But honestly, the the final two minutes of that game and the Houston game completely flipped on a dime. The AFC playoff picture changed drastically in the final two minutes of those yeah. two games, because both teams looked like they were going to lose. They won. And now both are, uh, you know, pos- have positioned themselves uh, I- I greatly for uh, the postseason play. So uh, th- this week was a big one for uh, the winners, the losers uh, of, of their, you know, final push here for the postseason. We've got flinchers. We've got clinchers. Let's get to it in our week 15 recap. <laughs> All right, you saw it right there. Missed opportunities. Just the three teams mentioned there, Cowboys, Packers, and Jags, but there were several other teams that missed an opportunity to either keep pace among the playoff standings or uh, put themselves in a higher seed or insert themselves into the playoff race. Uh, Nonetheless, a lot of teams knocked themselves out, while a few others did capitalize and seized this opportunity uh, to catapult themselves back into it. So before we get into this one, Mark, we'll just kind of look at the lay of the land here with the playoff scenarios uh, as we look at the playoff picture here on NFL.com. There are four teams that have clinched a playoff berth, only one of which is in the AFC. AFC. So the Baltimore Ravens, only AFC team to clinch a playoff spot. They are 11-3, and three, and they are in the one seed, likely to retain that pending a collapse here because the 10 and four Miami dolphins, whom I believe they have a tiebreaker over uh, and we'll get to face uh, coming up uh, either next week or the week after Um, Miami has Dallas. Miami has Dallas, Baltimore, Buffalo final three. 
Yeah, that's a brutal slog there yeah. for the Dolphins. But the they Chiefs got to ten wins. Five. They got to yeah. ten wins, so you feel like they're they're going to be safe. Like I feel like they're a wild card team at the worst right now, Miami. And yeah. if they just win one of those games, then they're they're a hundred percent in the playoffs. But yeah, they again, Miami. That's that that Monday night loss was so brutal because that was their cushion game. You know what I mean? That was the cushion game. This should have been the eleventh win, and then. The, ever all the rest on out uh, should have been you know kind of like what you take what you can get and you you know you want to feel good about it but yeah Miami their season flipped on a dime with that Monday night loss yeah that was that was a you know a, a really tough one to swallow for them but they are in that two seed as we speak if they get one more win I think it's probably fair to say they will take the East uh, three well, yeah. teams. The Buffalo oh, yeah, game, ahead. if they the B- Buffalo is still alive for the East, if Buffalo wins out wins and up, Miami yeah. loses one of the next two, if Miami goes one and one and Buffalo goes two and over the next two, then, then that it'll game shape up for a showdown. Then yeah. that game is the winner. The winner gets the division, which is awesome. That's what the NFL does. This stuff with the late game, uh, yep. you know, divisional games. You want those moments. Um, so I think a lot of fans are kind of. A guy like me, I'm I'm rooting for that game to be that. I want Miami to find a way to beat Dallas and lose to Baltimore, and then all of a sudden, you know, Buffalo goes two and zero. Buffalo's got an easy schedule now, go leading up to that Miami game. So Buffalo finally gets a little bit of a break. I think they have the Chargers and the Patriots or something like that, and it's it's a it's a winnable stretch here for Buffalo uh, to then get uh, put themselves in a spot to compete for the division again. Well, they're certainly playing their best football as of late, so that uh, bodes well for their chances. In the NFC, the only division to be clinched in the entire NFL is the NFC West, the San Francisco 49ers. Lock that one up. They sit in the one seed currently in the NFC standings as well at 11-3. and The other two clinchers are the Philadelphia Eagles and Dallas Cowboys. Eagles play tonight, so that will go a long way to determining uh, their push for the one seed as well. If they lose this one, they're still a game out. But based on tiebreakers, I feel like it'd be a game and a half lead for the 49ers, which might be enough cushion there for San Fran to to feel comfortable enough about that one seed. But the Eagles still can push for that. Cowboys, uh, brutal loss this week that jumped, uh, dropped them out of the NFC East title currently, and they're in the five seed. But they have nonetheless uh, clinched a playoff spot already. So four total teams there. We've got plenty in the hunt, as we'll discuss as we go through these games. Um, to to see which teams have put themselves in a great position there uh, at the top of those standings. So we'll start with the uh, the Saturday games, Mark. We already talked about Thursday night football between the Chargers and Raiders. Go check out our Friday show for that. But the Vikings uh, go on the road to Cincinnati. This one required overtime, but Jake Browning and company are able to get it done. Twenty seven to twenty four. Uh, Nick Mullins was starting for Minnesota there. And, uh, you know, it was really the Ty Chandler show for Minnesota. They were able to run the ball better than maybe they have all season long. Uh, so I, I take it he'll be the starting running back the rest of the way. But this maybe falls in the category of missed opportunities for the Minnesota Vikings as they really had a chance to to improve to eight and six and, and feel pretty good about their standings uh, in the NFC. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they lose and they're still in the sixth seed. So they still got a spot. But uh, you, you definitely have less cushion now. Meanwhile, the Bengals, it was, it was a game they needed to have, and they pulled out a victory there. So it's kind of funny, Mark. I mean, the both, the two of us were kind of, uh, you know, uh, mourning the Bengals and the Browns after their quarterbacks go down, and, and both of them find themselves in playoff contention right now. So just goes to show you, man, uh, some of these coaching staffs are doing a heck of a job with their backup quarterbacks to keep their teams in this thing. And we may be talking about, multiple backup quarterbacks starting games in the playoffs and not just getting thrust into that situation, being a part of what led the team to that point. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, great coaching jobs from both the Bengals and the, and the Vikings dealing with with this season and to have their teams in positions. If I was the Vikings, I would give the rookie another chance. I'd go back to Jaron Hall. He had the reason we got the Josh Dobbs experience is because Jaron Hall had a really good fun first, like, quarter and a half and then he got a concussion and Josh Jobs had to come in but Jaron Hall is just way more mobile and in young and athletic Nick Mullins is fine but he is like a poor man's Kirk Cousins and it just it they, there were times where you're that one of the worst interceptions we've ever seen where a guy was sitting down getting a sack and got an interception yeah. so like 
they can't be worse than that. And then to credit the Bengals, man, they fought. They stayed alive. Browning has just been on a tear. What a second half from him. T. Higgins with one of the greatest touchdown so I've ever seen in my life with the reaching his one arm behind his back. Like what's what awareness, what balls to do that late in the game and everything on the line. So the Bengals to me are the ultimate playing with house money team. We said it when Joe Burrow went down, the smartest thing they could do is to just go into the tank and get a better draft pick. The next smartest thing they could do is do this, like play their nuts off and just build this culture that they already have built about winning and then you add Joe Burrow back into that next year, and the and the vibes in in Cincinnati are extremely high. They feel like they have the right coach, they have the right roster. They just got to get their guy back. And who knows, Jake Browning, you know he's he's on a magical run right now. And I don't I don't know if he's going to earn himself a starting job next year, depending on how this thing all ends, or if he's just earned himself back up for life to Joe Burrow. Uh, but either way, he's made himself a ton of money, and uh, and uh, he's extended his NFL career by about a decade. Yeah, well, I mean, Joe Burrow has not been the, you know, uh, poster child of health in health, his yeah. NFL career. And so if I'm the Bengals, I'm doing every I'll I'll pay Jake Browning top dollar to be the top paid backup in the league uh, if he leads this team to the playoffs. And we got to feel comfortable with that, him being in the system and uh, having that safety valve to know that if Burrow does get hurt, your season's not, you know, uh, in complete tank mode because they weren't in a good position when Burrow did get hurt. So Browning really has helped elevate the team in some ways. And so that's yeah. a, that, that's a big lift there for Cincinnati. Uh, agree with everything you said there. And if you're Minnesota, I do feel like go to the I, rookie. I know you're still, yeah, you, you are still in a position. It's hard because you are in that, you know, six seed right now and you don't want to let things go off the rails. But I mean, yeah, Jaron Hall can't play worse than Nick Mullins. You know, there was, an, and, and with Justin Jefferson back at that, your offense has already gotten a boost. So yeah. uh, that's a big opportunity there for Minnesota to strike uh, the remainder of the season. Steelers go on the road at the Colts in a, in a must-win game for Pittsburgh, uh, in my opinion, at least. Uh, yeah, They're now outside it, of the playoff picture. They were was. the sixth seed. Uh, yeah, it, it was. Uh, the Colts also is a must-win for them, too, uh, to keep themselves in the running here. Uh, they get a win, a convincing win at that. And uh, the Steelers end the Mitch Trubisky era, as we talked off, um, talked about at the beginning of the show. As Mason Rudolph has, Rudolph has now been named the starter if Kenny Pickett does not return next week, which it looks like he probably won't. Uh, but there's a chance, nonetheless. Anyways, uh, you think pitiful. he'd actually I mean, go for gonna... Thursday night? Or no, they're not uh, Thursday they're not, night. They're not playing Thursday. They're playing another Saturday game. So. Saturday. Sorry, I uh, said that in the opening Thursday. Thursday's Rams and Saints. But yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah. So, I mean, it's still still on the outside looking in, I'd say. But uh, obviously, if he can go, uh, they're going to need to play go. because they basically have to win out and kind of hope that things fall their way. If they win out, they still get to 10 wins and probably a shot at that seven seed for sure. But they've got the Bengals, the Seahawks and the, the Ravens uh, to end the season. Not the easiest road here no. for Pittsburgh. They definitely shot themselves in the foot yet again. Um you know, Mike Tomlin had probably one of the most candid press conferences I've seen of him, uh, seen him give in his career so far. So uh, we'll see what happens uh, with the team. But they are a team that really doesn't play together at all. We saw George Pickens once again taking plays off. So, uh, you know, that doesn't bode well for really uh, how this team is uh, is is acting with their demeanor, let alone playing on the football field. Meanwhile, Indy. A huge win. They they imposed their will in many ways and showed that yes, with uh, the turmoil that we faced this year, and you know, ended up releasing Shaq Leonard, um, all of that, you know, they have overcome and they've gotten themselves to eight and six. And it, it, they did that yesterday or Saturday without Michael Pittman, Pittman for the majority of the game, and without their starting uh, or their backup running back, who was their starting running back, and Zach Moss. So that's you got to feel great if you're indie. Yeah. You're able to put up 30 points on a pretty decent defense, although uh, you know one that missed a lot of players as well. But you know, I, I think this says a lot more about indie because at, at this point Pittsburgh was you know off the rails and not much more to be said about them. They are they are a team that's uh, you know in constant free fall at this point. But indie really uh, put themselves in a great position here, and you know they're a tough team. They're a scrappy group, and uh, very well could find themselves. Uh, in the six, uh, in the six, seven seed, 
heck, man, maybe they compete for the AFC South. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? They're very alive for the AFC South. I, I truly believe that. The AFC South is far but over, in my opinion, especially after another bad effort from Jacksonville last night. I'll say this. These are two teams that obviously were battling, you know, going into this week were in the playoff picture, and only one of those teams – I do. Not I like even want to watch team? play football going <laughs> yeah. forward. And that's the team that won. Yeah. So, you know, Indianapolis, again, their ceiling is extremely low, but they're a fun, low ceiling team. Like Pittsburgh is a low ceiling team. That's painful to watch. And it just looks, nothing looks right with what Pittsburgh's doing right now. There was some really bad footage for Najee Harris going around online late Saturday night and Sunday morning yeah. about the dude can't see like he's, he's like Stevie wonder out there. He's just missing gigantic openings. And like, what do they need to do? Just uh, w overall, I think Indianapolis right now, they are a, the AFC South is just an incredible story. Will Levis playing better it than is. expected. And then obviously the, the Texans and now, and now the Colts, you know, without, without their number three overall pick, it's a fun story. I, I'm going to keep riding the Colts here. I think the Colts could could absolutely win out. Their schedule is is capable for them doing that. They're fun watch. I'm going to keep I'd rather watch them play football than Pittsburgh, so uh, I'm happy they they took care of business in that game. I would also rather watch the Colts play football than <laughs> Pittsburgh. It is absolute man just news fast. Uh by the way, Demonte Casey got uh suspended for the rest of yeah, the year. I saw that hit on Michael Pittman. I don't necessarily agree with that uh cuz I do think he led with his shoulder on that play. I agree. Uh, it's hard for to find out what defenders do in that situation because Pittman makes that catch if he doesn't get hit. So it's like you got to do something to make the guy, you know, drop the pass. Um, but I understand yeah, that. The, I, like the, you know, I understand why it was flagged. I get why it was flagged. I think um, the suspension is also because he had been flagged previously yeah. this year. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know, man. It's just the, the, the NFL ref is now this it, year has had a real, real rough year for them. And it's been about three years of that now. Yeah. But I think the NFL is just at this point too now where anything that looks too violent, they're just yeah. going to throw the flag because they want to show in general player safety. So it's like, it's about, we're going to show you it's our, the our, of it. our caring for the player safety. Yeah. Any true experts. I saw you, you had retweeted the bus with the boys guys. They've been great. Uh, McAfee has been also great about like calling out the dumb big fines and stuff like that. And so um, I, I'm with that. I'm with them a hundred percent in the, on the field football stuff, but I also get what the NFL is doing and just basically saying that looked too ugly. So we're just going to uh, suspend him because we gotta, we gotta look like we care. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, you know, that that's just the way it goes nowadays. Uh, the lions get a huge Love win this. over the Broncos. Love this this is win. another classic game of, Seizing opportunity and missing it. Uh, the Broncos with a chance here to go to eight and six and uh, assert themselves into the conversation. They fall to seven and seven. Lions with a 42 to 17 win. Very convincing win. Sam Laporta, an absolute star at tight end in Stud. his rookie year. Three touches. This is one of the best rookie tight end seasons uh, that I can ever think of. Oh, uh, that is a position that is like notorious for not being uh, easy Mike to Dick transition to the NFL. Yeah, very much. Yeah, that's very true. Um, so he is an absolute superstar. This draft for the Lions is proving to be just dominant, uh, especially their first three picks. So uh, the Lions are, are are getting themselves back into that formula at the right time because yeah. there was a, a little bit of a concern there uh, with a couple losses uh, over the last month or so. But uh, back to a big win for the Lions. So I think Detroit uh, really said a lot with this win. And, uh, you know, they are the three seed right now and still very much in play at 10 and four uh, to even maybe find themselves getting into the two seed. Um, and if everything goes right, they could be the one seed. I mean, who knows, man? Uh, a lot can happen here for Detroit. The Lions are indoor cats, man, and they play well at home. They're a different team at home in the dome. And the defense showed up, too, which is great because that's the concern right now for Detroit. I will say this was to me and this was an easy one to predict. I actually on my Saturday show. I went three and zero on the Saturday games. I I picked the Bengals. I had picked the uh, uh, the Colts and the Lions. I, all three just felt like they were better. Just good matchups for Detroit. That was such a good matchup. And I think one of the problems is Denver. Um, you you see that Denver is just not in rhythm. Like Denver can make big plays. Cortland Sutton's been good, and Russ has been good at finding him. But otherwise, as far as the sustained drives, big rhythm 
It's just non-existent. They just don't, nothing feels smooth with Denver still right now. Now, now Denver, I will say, don't count them out. You're saying, oh, Denver lost. They're probably dead. They played the Patriots, the Chargers, and the Raiders, their final three games. Denver could absolutely get to 10 wins. So don't count out Denver. But I do think this was great for Lions fans to build some more confidence. Again, the Lions have a very workable end of the season stretch, including two against Minnesota. And we just talked about Minnesota not knowing their quarterback right now. So the Lions absolutely can also win out. And the Lions in the Dome playing maybe two guaranteed games at Ford Field, you know, that's huge. Like, that is no, a, that's that, massive. That's all of a sudden the Lions in the a- NFC Championship game. And all it takes is someone upsetting the Niners then. And all of a sudden you could be playing the NFC Championship game at Ford Field. And we just saw what the Lions could do at Ford Field. They're a different team, and that fan base would be – they'd break the Chiefs and the Seahawks sound barrier record if they were playing an NFC Championship game at home. I, I'll tell you that right now. So, uh, yeah, this is, again, why people have got on me for get, for wanting to put the Lions lower on the Super Bowl plane and giving up on the Lions. No way, man. They, this team has real talent. They've gone through a couple rough patches right now, but when they're not playing within their division and they're playing at home – they they like don't lose at all. Yeah, no, they're very very good at controlling their environment and uh, asserting dominance at will. And I think that speaks to Dan Campbell's job. And there, the and the, that and the Broncos aren't dead yet. Don't count the Broncos out yet. I don't. They're not. I'm going to bet hey, against the Broncos if they make the playoffs. Like they'll lose to whoever they play in the playoffs. But they have I an easy agree. three right game stretch to get to the playoffs. And on top of that, all three games are not only division opponents, AFC opponents, if they somehow find themselves huge tiebreaker win, stuff, they could, yeah, they could, they could break through some of those tiebreakers and, uh, and find themselves in that, you know, I don't know if anyone season. has an easier final three games than Pat's chargers Raiders. It's pretty, that's pretty juicy matchup for sure. Let's talk about your bears, uh, with victory in hand against the Cleveland Browns. Yeah. Yeah, Joe Flacco and company mm-hmm. lead them down to get uh, yeah. you know the game winner mm-hmm. late. Justin Fields yeah. tosses up a hail mary, which drops into the hands of Darnell yeah. Mooney as he fell. Obviously, yeah. not the easiest play to make, but he did drop it. I don't know, man. Is this uh, is this well, just listen. like part of the the Bears' DNA at this point? Is just below because they've they've had so many leads in the fourth quarter this year. They've yeah, they, there's a bunch of stats out there. I, I know Barstool Big Cat, t- there was a video going viral, and I retweeted it too about like how it's the first time a team has lost with that many interceptions and that lead in the fourth, going into the fourth quarter, and other teams have been like 40, you know, or something. There, There's a bunch of st- history on it. Just know that if you didn't watch the game, the Bears once again found a way to, to lose in historic fashion. The third historic loss this year in the fourth quarter for the Chicago bears. And I will say this, I've known it since, you know, by week four. I mean, I was confident. I gave Matt Eberflus the benefit of the doubt. Hey, last season was terrible. He had no players. We had, we, we said it all off season, this bears team added talent. Like they needed to improve. And once they started zero and four and were losing the way they were losing, we said it over and over and over again. Like it just, it's obvious the head coach is not the type of head coach that can elevate this team to be, uh, you know, annual NFC North winners. Like you want a head coach that you can trust can win your division year in and year out. Like I'm, I know factually I've known now for the better part of two months. That's, that's not Matt Eberflus. So like, I'm not angry about this loss in the sense that I'm disappointed because a Robert Tunyon giant drop ball, or Darnell Mooney drop an unnecessary call going for a Hail Mary at the end of the first half when you gave you got in enough position to give Cairo a chance to get points on the board there. I know he's not great from long distances, but you'd rather that than I guess the Hail Mary, you know, the Hail Mary pass. I think, you know, uh points are a premium. I will say this. To me, the most frustrating thing is again, all the Bears had to do in the second half was put one drive together. Like they needed one drive. It's somewhere in the third or fourth quarter. They couldn't do that. And uh, uh, people are blaming Justin, but I watched the game. Like, I know Justin holds onto the ball too long sometimes, but the play calling and the offensive scheme is just horrible. This Chicago Bears team last year led the league in rushing. They led the league in rushing. Remember, all last season, a year ago, we were saying, hey, at least they have an identity. 
They're going to run the ball down your fucking throat, and they're going to beat you to shit with David Montgomery and Khalil Herbert and Justin Fields. They're just going to run you to death. This team cannot run the football now. And what you needed to do against a stingy Cleveland defense late in the, somewhere in the in the third and fourth quarter was put together a 12-play, you know, 60-yard field goal drive, and they would have won that game. But they don't have the ability to do that because their center is garbage. They need a new, an upgraded guard, left guard, and then the running backs are just not good. I, I like Roshan Johnson, but they don't play him enough. Khalil Herbert is not a, a starting caliber NFL running back. That's a huge whiff by the Bears front office. As much as I like what Ryan Poles has done, that's a whiff. Imagine if this team still had David Montgomery. You let your you let your your rivals get him, and he is carrying that rushing attack for Detroit that may be walking themselves to an NFC championship game. And you didn't have to overpay to keep him. So there's a lot of things like that to me is what drives me crazy this morning. Is it's like, again, this team is too talented to lose games like that. So if I believe they're too talented to lose games like that, then I look at the coaching staff and the and the positions they're putting them in, uh, and it's just a failure. On the flip side, the Browns are again a really fun story, and I and I'm all in on the Browns getting the five seed and and going to Baltimore and maybe upsetting them in round one. Like, who's not <laughs> all imagine in on Joe Flacco and yeah. his reunion at, so, at Baltimore? That'd be wild. That's my stance on the Bears. My, my stance on the Bears has not changed. It's been the same since they started 0-4. I will always believe in Justin Fields. I think Justin Fields should be the quarterback of the Bears. Uh, if, if Ryan Poles goes a different way, uh, you know I'm going to support my team no matter what. But the most important thing, and I've said it since week four, is this team cannot be coached by Matt Eberflus and this staff going forward. And if that means I have to get a new quarterback, too, to get rid of the coach, then I live with that. I move forward. The Bears, luckily, are in a position where they have an embarrassment of riches, whether it's free agency and through the draft, to add to this team. And they're not that far away. The Bears are not that far away, which I think also is what drives us crazy. Let me ask you this about in regards to the coaching thing. I don't want to go too far off topic here, but I am curious. Is it easier to tell when the coach isn't it than it is to tell if the coach is it? For instance, you said that you know by now, you know that Matt Eberflus isn't the guy to take this team to a championship. On the flip side, we probably felt pretty good about Nagy after winning coach of the year and winning the division title, you know, early in, in his run, right? Like, is it yeah, but easier to tell when they remember, aren't the guy than Yeah, than but remember midway through midway through the second season with Matt Nagy, the Bears were an offensive mess. None of the fun, cute right. stuff was yeah. working anymore, and the team hated each other. The one thing that Eberflus has over Nagy is the team doesn't hate each other. But I believe if you listen to the quotes from Darnell Mooney and J De, uh, and and more. Did you see DJ Moore and Darnell no. Mooney's quotes? Well, I, they, I saw. Yeah, are you talking about they, Justin? Yes. They yes. both came out and said that dude's the guy. Like that yeah. dude is the guy. So and DJ I think, even said, uh, comparing him to to Caleb uh, Williams, yeah. Jake May is like he's better than those guys. So yeah. I think that's the difference with, and I don't think I don't give any credit to Eberflus on this. I think the difference is with that Bears team in 2019 in Nagy's second year versus Eberflus' second year. The team was very split on Mitch isn't the dude or is Nagy not the dude. I, there's no one in that locker room who doesn't think Justin Fields is the dude. I, and that's the thing, the difference is that yeah. a lot of those guys, I think, are at this point are still just playing for him. And that Robert Tunyon drop, Darnell Mooney drop, like I know that a lot of those guys are kicking themselves in that way because I think they all know that it's not necessarily his fault. So I would make that argument in that sense, it's a great question. All I know is you know it when you know it. D'Amico Ryans, that guy's the dude I want leading my franchise, right? You know it early. Um, by year two, midway through year two, Dan Campbell, that's the guy I want leading my franchise. Yeah, Sirianni. You know. By midway through year two, Matt Eberflus is terrible at the at the podium. He's terrible in the post-game locker room speeches, and he is dropping 300-pound linemen in coverage on crucial plays in the fourth quarter, and he's the guy calling the defense because he can't keep a defensive coach hired because they have to be let go for HR reasons. Like it's just not, it's not it. And yeah, I, I and final point. I know we're going way long in this, but again, I blame the lack of the identity of the run game on your head football coach. Your head football coach. I don't care if he's an offensive or defensive guy. 
How can your head football coach not love what you did last year being the leading team in rushing and not yeah, make it known awesome. every single week to your offensive coordinator, go back to that playbook and run the goddamn football. But like he's not so he's not smart enough or a good enough leader to even save his job that way. So I again I blame him for a lot of that. It, Justin's not perfect. Justin's not but but and I know it. And I, and it's hard it's getting hard to defend him because his fourth quarter stats aren't great. They're they're terrible actually. But when when you've been such an inept quarterback franchise to see a guy with that talent and that pop, yeah, it's hard it, to, it, to It's really hard that, right? for me to just let him go for another, I hope that Caleb Williams is good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, let, let's be clear here. We don't know if Caleb Williams is going to make it in the NFL. We don't know if Drake May is. Anyone can say that these people are surefire. I mean, Ryan Leaf was surefire, and I know that that's like a classic one people go to. But Trevor Lawrence is surefire, and he was, was garbage considered. last night. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we I still feel good about him long term. But yeah, he's he's played poorly um, and, and played terribly his rookie year. Um, so yeah, there's, there, nothing's a sure thing, man. So when you've got the production on tape, when you have a- yeah. actual things to point to, yeah, it's, uh, but it's the Browns are a fun story. Browns are a fun story. We're, I'm, I'm pro Browns at this point. Yeah. Yep. For sure. The Browns are, uh, really making it easy to root for them for sure. And that's coming from a Steelers fan. I, I, ha- I hate the Browns <laughs> for many reasons, but, uh, but you know, the Joe Flacco story alone is pretty enticing. The Buccaneers get a huge win, 34 to 20 over Green Bay. Green Bay, uh, man, this was this might be the one game where both sides had such a stark contrast for what happened to their seasons resulting from this. The Buccaneers, uh, you know, are are in control right now of the NFC South at seven and seven. Meanwhile, the Green Bay Packers have fallen out of favor all the way down to the 11 seed. At six and eight, with a very uphill battle now for Cream Bay moving forward, just were not able to get it done. Whereas Baker Mayfield throws four touchdowns, seems to have a little bit of a resurgence. I'm not saying that his career is going to all of a sudden take off, but look, we talked about it either last week or the week before, even that. Look, I mean, if Baker gets this to where it's a, 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 a division win, yeah, they may move off of Todd Bowles. But who's to say Baker Mayfield isn't the starting quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for the next three years? Baker Mayfield is he's done to Geno Smith. He's this year's Geno Smith. He has earned himself a starting job in the NFL next year, whether it's in Tampa, whether it's somewhere else. He will be a starting quarterback in the NFL next year. Um, I think he probably hopes it's with Tampa. There's He's still got Mike Evans. He doesn't look like maybe he's going yeah. anywhere. Uh, maybe a buck for life type of thing. And the Bucs right now are playing really, really solid football. And I'll say this. I don't know if it's because the are the Bucs offensively popping right now or the, the Green Bay Packers defensively just that inept. And the Packers have spent so much money on defense, so much draft capital on defense. And they, are just, they were just letting Baker go up and down the field. And that's the week after there were the, the Green Bay, the, the, the Wisconsin media was hounding their own – defensive coordinator like get pressure like you let Tommy DeVito walk up and down you come home and your defense gives that kind of effort like I, I'm not the biggest Jordan Love fan but we expected the offense to struggle with a first year starting quarterback and a bunch of kids like first and second year weapons like you expect the offense to have rough, pat- rough patches and they were supposed to lean on their defense the Packers listen that three game win streak I think maybe it just was one of those things where now that was that was unfair. It got a lot of people's, I think, hopes up for the Packers. All of a sudden, they could be the surprise team. And the Packers are going to end the season probably just about what we thought they'd be, a 7-8 win team. Uh, and 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 that's the Green Bay Packers this year. They were going to have rough patches. So I think in totality, when we in three months from now, when we look back at the Packers season, we'll say, yeah, that's how we predicted. Jordan Love up and down, 7-8 win team, just missed the playoffs. That's the Packers. But the way they're doing it right now, it makes you feel like there's more trouble in Green Bay than there needs to be. They, they, I think they need a new defensive coordinator. And I don't know if they need to spend a ton of money on offense. I think they just need to let that offense mature, like eight, literally age and get game yeah. age. And then, um, and then you know, defensively, they have playmakers. They're just not making the plays. That's probably the biggest 
issue for the Green Bay offense is the fact that they aren't able to really get enough of the reps in because Christian Watson, their biggest you know star, just hasn't been healthy yeah. enough this year. And you, you really need to get those reps in with him and Jordan Love so that 2024 comes around and you're feeling good about the offense. I mean, Jaden Reed is a, a really solid rookie. Uh, Dontavian Wicks is, is no slouch. You know, they appear Dobbs. to have two really good tight ends and Tucker Craft and Luke Musgrave now who are, you know, young rookies as well. So it's, you know, there's a lot to look forward to in Green Bay. And I think the biggest thing for them is even if the season is kind of gone off the rails a little bit uh, when you did have such a high at one point is I think they have clarity, at least with Jordan Love, that they're going to run it back next year. Oh, yeah. Like with Jordan Love. He's the dude. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he maybe he's not a long term dude, but he's he's bought himself some more rope as well. And I think even if they lose, uh, you know, a lot of more games and they go seven and 10 this year. Uh, so be it. Uh, you know, y- and you were able to get the training wheels off, and that's the biggest thing. And the Bucks, the Bucks right now are absolutely the favorites for the NFC South. And if you they look at the Bucks be. schedule, yeah. I'm not, I, if I'm not mistaken, the Bucks could win out. Like they're a they're a team that has a very workable schedule. And then it's it's crazy because three weeks ago we were talking about I don't want to watch anyone from the NFC South. We might have two NFC South playoff teams now with the way they're that's going insane. with. With the Saints and the Bucks, if the Saints can find a way to win out and the Bucks win out, and they're both capable of doing that. Yeah, for the Buccaneers coming up next is two home games, Jaguars and uh, Saints, and then okay, they end so the they season at Carolina. Out. So uh, the Saints and Panthers for sure um, are are for the taking, and it's two divisional games. That, that could very well be enough there for Tampa. Uh, but the Jaguars game, the way that uh, Jacksonville's been playing, uh, isn't a, a guarantee for the Jags either uh the Texans win in overtime Huge and win. and Ace. the playoff hopes for the Tennessee Titans as they officially get eliminated Will Levis did look good for portions of this game and uh you know inspired hope but uh this team kind of collapsed in the second half did the Tennessee Titans and uh Case Keenum uh the, you know a, a drink of the fountain of youth for a moment here was able to lead the team down and and uh, able to get them a victory there, nineteen to sixteen win for Houston as they improved to eight and six, and that was a big win for them. I didn't think uh, Tennessee really had a, a great realistic chance of making the postseason this year, so this was a much bigger deal for Houston, uh, needing to win this game. It was ugly, it wasn't pretty, but you were without C.J. Stroud, you get the win. Huge thing for Houston there that they were able to survive not having their star rookie quarterback and uh, and get the victory. Now they get him back again for this, you know, final stretch or supposedly get him back. I would imagine that he'll clear yeah. by the time next week comes around. And uh, and now Houston is looking like a team that probably is in the driver's seat, despite currently being on the bubble. Uh, I feel very confident where we sit right now that they're going to be one of those wildcard teams pending CJ Stroud staying healthy. But uh, Case Keenum showed that he can get them a win if they need it. Yeah, that, I mean, that was huge. Uh, and credit to Case Keenum for coming on in and playing good football, taking over, you know, getting into overtime. Houston has a home against the Browns. That's going to be a really tough game and a great game and a meaningful game. Then they get the Titans again at home, and then they're at the Colts. That Colts game could be both of those teams battling for the a wild card spot. Winner gets in, loser goes home. And I would take C.J. Stroud in that game, depending on, you know, how everything falls out as opposed to uh, the Colts. So, Really interesting next three weeks for the Texans, but see, uh, uh, Case Keenum did just enough to keep them alive to make sure these next three games are interesting. That's for sure. And again, with Will Levis, like I've said over and over again, I've seen enough to go, all right, support Will Levis this offseason. Go get him another wide receiver, work on that offensive line, and Vrabel coach up the defense, spend a bunch of draft capital on some defense, pass rushers, and, and Tennessee should be a really interesting team next year. No Tyree kill, no problem for the Miami Dolphins. Huge, they shut huge. out the New York Jets. 30 to nothing win for Miami. They proved improved to 10 and 4. They are the second seed currently in the AFC standing. Still haven't clinched a playoff berth, but uh pretty close to doing so. Meanwhile, the Jets hopes uh with the news of Aaron Rodgers potentially being ready to be cleared. Uh yeah, I think they're gonna put a kibosh on his return. There's they're nothing eliminated. to play for now as the Jets are officially eliminated as well. Uh, that's pretty much all you have to say about it. Miami with a convincing win. Yeah, I know it's the Jets, uh, but to win 30 to nothing in that fashion without your star receiver, uh, to me, that said a lot. And again, I don't know how Miami's going to perform in the playoffs when it comes to playing in other venues. 
uh, when, when how they're going to be able to perform in certain elements throughout the league. But, you know, from what we're just seeing from them playing and, and their ability, uh, they're a really good team. And I think that they are deserving of the two seed, which is where they sit right now. And, um, you know, we'll see if they can contest for that one seed with the Baltimore. But I, I my, my, you know, money's on the Ravens hanging tight onto there. But Miami playing well right now, and uh, they'll get Tyreek back likely next week and even be more, you know, formidable down the stretch here. Maybe no one had a more important moral win for themselves than the Miami Dolphins did this weekend, and here's why. They played like poop on national TV and got beat up physically, and everyone was saying, oh, look, Tyreek Hill gets injured, and they can't play football. Well, they sat Tyreek Hill, and they went out against a divisional opponent with a great defense, and they they made Waddle Tyree kill and it was like they it was like they didn't miss a beat. So that's great coaching. That is great locker room. That is great you know momentum for them. Uh, obviously they'd like to have that win that that game back against Tennessee and be in the one seed right now if they had found a way to win that game. But this was a mo- not only just a big victory for them on the field, but a huge moral victory for them as far as the confidence of this team. They got a divisional win, a big divisional win, without their star player when the whole world was saying they can't even move the ball without their star player. So that's great. Now, Miami has the toughest. They're the opposite of the Broncos. They have the toughest stretch down, you know, games down the stretch. You have uh, the you have the Cowboys, you have the uh, Ravens, and then you have uh, the Bills. If Miami finds a way to go 2-1 and one or 3-0 and oh in that stretch, then Miami are not only they'll be the one seed, but they'll be the favorites. I think probably to win the Super Bowl if they go three and one. Excuse me, down that stretch. That is it. That would be an impressive, impressive stretch. On the flip side, if they find a way to go zero and three or one and two, then Miami is kind of what we thought, which is a team that on any given Sunday could get, deliver a knockout blow with that offense. But overall, you can't trust them. So we're going to learn a ton more about Miami over the next three weeks. I feel a lot better about some of these other teams in the AFC, like the uh, Bengals, for instance, or the Chiefs or the Ravens, to be able to afford to win on the road in the postseason. Miami's not one of those teams. I feel like the one seed is a more important to Miami than maybe any of these other AFC teams. Well, winning right the division, especially uh, Miami, Miami, yes. if they fall to the wild card, they, got to host gonna, one game. Yeah. Well, and, and if Miami falls to the wild card, remember it'll because they went one and two or zero oh and three down the stretch. So they're going to, they will have lost with that, you know, with the Titans game, three of their final four or three of their final five or something like that. And it's like, you know, you know, and that's just not a great way to go into the playoffs for a team that we have physicality questions about anyway. So I agree with you. Crucial for Miami, if they want any sort of postseason success, to do it from at home with an AFC AFC East title behind them. Six teams have been eliminated from the postseason, three in each conference. In the NFC, it's the Panthers, Cardinals, and Commanders. In the AFC, it's the Titans, Jets, and the New England Patriots, who lost by 10 to the Kansas City Chiefs yesterday. And I know that a lot of uh, talk out there is, you know, worry about Kansas City because they only won by 10 against a really bad team. I don't know. I kind of felt like this was a game where, you know, New England's got a really good defense, a much better defense than maybe they're given credit for. And I like they matched up well with a, a Pacheco less Kansas City team and an offense that was struggling. Kansas City's offense still struggled in this game. But I, for them to get a 27 to 17 win, I actually felt a little bit better about Kansas City. I felt like they they needed that win. They realized yeah. the importance of it. It was in Gillette Stadium. Uh, did did you feel like this was a maybe not a full turning the corner for Kansas City, but at least something that gets them in the right direction and maybe it a was a bit stop of a the bleeding. Yeah, it was a stop there the bleeding go. game, yeah. right? Mahomes, the two interceptions, game. but the one with Tony. I mean, that's not his fault at all. 300 plus yards it, at some time. point, man, they got to stop getting yeah. Tony out there. They got, he's no, hundred percent. I've said it for weeks now. I would, I would absolutely just move on from him. I would, I wouldn't put him out there. I wouldn't. And I, maybe that's, and who knows if he, if he costs them a big game in the playoffs or a big play in the playoffs, I think a lot of chiefs fans will be very, very upset with Andy Reid. They're not going to turn on Andy because Andy's got him two Super Bowls, but it's a mistake right now. In my opinion, to have Kadarius Tony on the field. Yeah. I think it's an absolute costing mistake. them big. Yeah. I agree. And um, I will say the cons- it, it was nice to see Clyde Edwards-Alaire play well in the receiving yeah. game, but 
But again, offensively, they couldn't run the ball much at all without Pacheco. So Chiefs, I'll feel better about is if they put up a 27 or a 30 point plus game here in the final couple games, they can keep scoring 27 or more down the stretch and get Pacheco back. So the run game is mirroring the pass game and Tony stops costing them, you know, costly turnovers. Then I'll, then I'll feel continually better about the chiefs. But again, right now the chiefs are just a team. I'm not willing to count out because they have Mahomes, They have Andy Reid, They have Travis Kelsey and Pacheco should be coming back healthy in a really solid offensive line. Tommy Cutlets gets served uh, on the road as the New Orleans Saints. Uh, I had to try yeah. at, at least once there. Okay. Uh, Saints, I like it. Saints did get a big win, even though they are on the outside Needed of the it. NFC South right now, but they they record-wise have the same record as the Tampa Bay Bucks, so they are still very much in contention, and they yeah. play Tampa later. So the Saints uh, stay alive, and and maybe stopping the bleeding is a, is a good phrase for New Orleans as well. The Giants weren't going anywhere. The uh, the fun ride is probably over there uh, with the whole Tommy DeVito thing. But uh, Saints get a 24-6 to win. They look pretty yeah. good. And they did this without Chris Olave, who I'm sure they'll get back next week. So uh, that's got to be at least encouraging that New Orleans uh, is still in this thing. And they could still have a winning record. And they could still take the division. Yeah, no, 100%. I agree. I mean, I, like, I, listen, Derek Carr had a little bit of a breakout game. Three touchdowns, no picks. And... And it felt like, okay, this is what we expected from them all season. Is it too little too late? Yeah, I mean, maybe, might, because now yeah. you have two tough games at, against the Rams Thursday night and then against the Bucks. That's their season now. If the Saints can find a way to, to string out and, and win these last three games, then you'll look at the ups and downs of the season and say, okay, Again, kind of like we talked about the Packers three months from now, the Saints end up as a 10-win team and win the NFC South and win out. We'll look at it and go, all right, that's kind of what we predicted from the Saints, right? They lost in the first round, but Derek Carr. and But, the, again, the ride has been so bumpy. I still think the best thing the Saints can do, honestly, is lose the next two, miss the playoffs, and it, and it, and it force themselves to not lie to themselves and, and, re, and rethink this whole thing and just start over. They're in cap hell. So just flush it, restart, and and get on pace with the other teams in your division who are all going to be trying to reset. The whole NFC South, don't be the last team to reset. Be the first team to get a jump start on the rebuild. Get ahead of everyone else. The Jags were a year ahead of the Titans, the Colts, and the Texans. Look how quickly those three teams have caught up to the Jags. Exactly. So yeah. you in the NFC South can be a lot like the AFC South really quickly. So if I'm... The Saints don't be the team who trots out Derek Carr again while all the other three teams have young stud quarterbacks. And then you're like, wait, what, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Yeah, you find yourself, uh, you know, in a, a very dicey situation uh, before your very eyes and, and in a division that might very well start to get increasingly competitive as the years move forward. I will let you gloat on this next matchup because uh, you were certainly more confident in the Los Angeles Rams coming into the season. And uh, they've pulled off another really impressive win 28 to 20 over Washington. Uh, they survived you know, Brissett. The, 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 they did. Yeah. Uh, but the Rams are just, they're controlling um, their own destiny and they're, they're handling their business. Well, yeah, and I think that's probably the best way to put it is they've now they're in the seven seed, you know, and, um, and at seven and seven, they're probably playing some of their best football as of late. They're starting to get healthy now. Kyron Williams is dominating in the run game for them. Like they finally kind of fixed that puzzle that they haven't had for a little bit. Uh, a lot of things working well for LA right now. I mean, are they a team that you feel confident in down the stretch here, but also like even, dare I say, come postseason time? Like, are they well, a team that can make a run in the NFC? If they can make it into the playoffs, they're obviously the one. Of, they're probably the NFC wildcard team that you're like, oh crap, I don't want to play them. Depending on who wins the NFC East, right? Like the Eagles or Cowboys, the Rams are going to be feisty. They're going to they're going to put up. They they have they're, again they're playing with total house money. No one thought they'd do anything this year, and the best thing to come with this year with the Rams again is they've reset their cap. They got a ton of young players who now have a ton of experience, and going into next year will be really great second year players in that system. The Rams are a free agent destination. The only thing I'd be saying if I'm a Rams fan, the most important thing is make sure Stafford and Cup and Nakua, whenever our season ends, are healthy so that yeah. we have we can sell 
the free agents and we can sell that to teams say, hey, you come be that two or three extra pieces we need. And the Rams absolutely are, again, this is just that rebuilding year for next year to will to make one final run at it. And so no one wants to play Stafford right now. He's balling out. And you said it, Kyron Williams is running the ball well. Rams are a fun story. And for the and for Washington, I hate that they did that to Sam Howell. Maybe the benching will be good for his confidence. I don't think there was any reason to do it. I, I get it. He was struggling in that game, but you're a dead, you're a dead, you know, coaching staff walking right now. I think that was just that was I'd be frustrated if I was the ownership of Washington. I'm like, you may have killed this kid's confidence just to what? Try to make yourself look better, prove a point. Like yeah, it, that didn't Got a feel stick to your guns moment. It yeah, it didn't like, feel you know, right. Yeah. It just didn't feel right. But wh- who knows? We'll see what what it comes of it. Maybe now Washington. Who knows? Maybe there was the owner also saying we're done with Sam Howell too. Maybe there's something beneath there saying that Washington could be a, a quarterback in the quarterback market this off season. I know there's still things that Brock Purdy probably needs to prove to the NFL world and <laughs> to analysts and things like that in terms of. <sighs> Being able to come back, you know, like they haven't had a whole lot of uh, adversity in games. They've been that dominant. But, I mean, who really cares? Because personally, I think they're the best team in the NFC right now. It yeah, might oh, be yeah. the best team in all of the NFL. Um, for, they're just playing lights out in, in so many facets of the game. The fact that you could find multiple MVPs on this team uh, just kind of speaks to the quality of the makeup of this group and uh, how they've been playing. 45-29 to 29 win over the Cardinals. Uh, you know, maybe doesn't look as dominant as it was. Uh, it's just the 49ers continue to impress. Uh, they had a very small rough patch in the middle of the season, but since then they've ironed everything out. They're healthy yep. and uh, they are, they're just the most dangerous team in the league. That, that's just yeah. really all, the, all, the way to put it. Yeah. There's nothing else to say. I mean, for the Niners right now, they, that three game skid was alarming and we all knew in our head it's because they're not healthy. And when they weren't healthy, Brock Purdy struggled, and they went 0-3 in a stretch. Now they are healthy, and Brock Purdy's thrown four touchdowns a game, and they're dominating people. And for the Niners, the only thing that can change the perception of them for us, I think, as fans and analysts, is Monday night. Like, they play a week from tomorrow, a week from tonight, they'll play the Ravens at home, Monday night football, and that'll be an absolute Super Bowl preview game. The lights will be bright. It'll be a real test for both teams. And that's going to be maybe the, the game of the year the coming down the final stretch. Like, so I, more to come on analyzing the Niners and how we feel about them beyond they're really awesome uh, post Monday night a week from today. And then we go into the last of the uh, afternoon scheduled games, the Cowboys at the Buffalo Bills. Uh, you were very right about this one. I was wrong. It was a pretty rough week for me, prediction wise. The Bills win thirty-one to ten, absolute drubbing of the Cowboys. And uh, here we go again, man. I feel foolish now, you know, after uh, after so many weeks and and years of being down on the Cowboys to uh, to let a a, a long streak, uh, you know, cloud my judgment of this group because they look terrible on the road in an environment outside of uh, you know Irving, Texas. And uh, and there we have it. It's uh, it's Dallas in a an enemy territory, not able to get it done when they're facing a team that has weapons to match and that has, uh, you know, an imposing will. You know, the Philadelphia game remains the lone impressive victory for Dallas this year. Meanwhile, the Buffalo, you know, kudos to them. That was they really, really obviously needed that. And that was a huge boost for them. Yeah, if Buffalo can run the ball like this from here on out. Seriously, whoa. yeah. James Cook, like, finally. Look out. I, I think Sean McDermott is saving his job. I think that uh, Josh Allen now has a chance to, if he wins out, I think Josh Allen has a chance to steal the MVP. Check those odds this morning. Uh, there, That might be something juicy you want to sprinkle some money on because if he wins out, they win the division, and he's. I, I think he's the MVP. Look at it. His numbers are are pretty staggering as far as quarterback, you know, numbers go. I think there's a real chance that could happen. Um, but I, I'll say this for Dallas. To me, they're I mean, listen, they're a lot like Detroit right now. At home, I- indoor cats with perfect conditions, they're a tough team to beat. They are nasty. The problem if I would be concerned about if I'm Dallas is 
We're the opposite in Detroit as far as expectations and media attention goes. So Detroit gets to kind of fly under the radar under this kind of lovable, fun story like Cleveland right now, right? Cleveland is a lovable, fun story because Deshaun's hurt. We don't like Deshaun, and they're winning without him. Detroit is, you know, very similar, like downtrodden cities that are way beyond their heyday but are having a, a renaissance and haven't won anything in a long time. But Dallas is the opposite because they're all the expectations, all the hate, and the glitz and glamour of Dallas. I'd be concerned if I was a Cowboys fan. That was a that was a gut punching loss. And um if you would if you would after the Eagles game bet the Cowboys to win the Super Bowl, I bet your 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 depending on how much money you put on that bet, you're hurting this this week thinking to yourself, why did I why did I waste that money? Absolutely. Yeah, most definitely. They are uh, a team that still obviously has things to prove uh, when it comes to their backs being up against the wall. Uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars are in a similar position. They yeah, have the Jags. Uh, they, they just uh, continue to to go through this wave here of impressive wins and then really bad losses and uh, just not being able to put a full 60 minutes together. This team is struggling, Mark. I think the most, the one thing I can point to, and we've talked about it throughout the year, obviously earlier in the year, I felt like they had so many drops and just missed opportunities. Um and, and that has continued, but they are just a really bad red zone team. They're really bad. Uh, and I was looking it up. They're 17th in the league in terms of red red zone percentage uh, converting touchdowns in the red zone. Uh, now, 17th, you, you'd say, you know, that's not atrocious. But in terms of all of the teams currently in the playoffs, it's the worst. Yeah. And so that's not, that's not something that can translate very well to postseason play. Like, you need to be able to turn those possessions into touchdowns. This team just can't. Uh, figure it out and you got to lay this at the feet of Trevor we're starting to get into a territory and I'm not saying he's as good as Josh Allen currently he's certainly not right now but it's it's starting to get that feel where it's like a lot is being laid at the feet of Trevor to to make the plays and thus he is trying to play hero ball too much and trying to do trying to do too many things and that's you had the fumble when he could have just slid, but he tried to get an extra few yards and then, you know, bobbles the ball. It's just like he's getting anxious and um, he's sailing balls and, you know. Uh, underthrows, too. There was some under- bad underthrows. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like he was hurt on that last drive because it didn't. It just yeah. didn't seem right. Yeah, there were a lot of low throws. It's ugly, I, I, Dan. I feel like he's getting jumpy, you know. There's and, no and identity good. to the Jags offense right now. They're not a, they don't do play action well. There's like nothing that you can just go back to like, all right, let's reset. Let's go to this. We know we can get a, te- a first down, you know, with this, this set of plays and this formation. They're missing Christian Kirk badly. He doesn't feel comfortable with the rest of his wide receivers. Flowers got injured for them last night. And then also, listen, Ridley has been a disappointment. I think all of us said like, dude, they're getting mm-hmm. a true number one in Ridley. He's been anything but a true number one in this offense. And so, yeah, they're very disjointed, very disjointed. That being said, they're definitely not dead and out of it. They have no, a the lot to prove. Is so easy. The rest. Yeah. Of the they way. have a lot to prove, but they're not, they're not dead and gone yet. And I think Jags fans are also realistic. Like Jags fans, they're just happy to be winning some games. Like, I don't think yeah. Jags fans, a lot like Lions fans and Browns fans. They're like, listen, we're not going to be too hard on our team here right now. Like we're, we're leading our division. Like this is a happy moment, right? Uh, but I do think it's frustrating because there's talent there. It just feels disjointed. And they don't have an identity for Baltimore. Listen, I, I they run the ball really well. And that is, and they, that, they lost their, they lost their big Mitchell, the big uh, yeah, playmaker. Mitchell, uh, towards ACL. They yeah, that's today. a bummer. There's a real bummer, but they, they are the Kings of just finding another running back and they're going to keep running the ball. They're running the ball really effectively at the right time of the year. That's dangerous. And they, and, Unlike years past, they they always do this, but now they have the outside weapons to where it's also like, oh, crap. If the run game gets stuffed up, they have Odell. They have Bateman. They have you know, Flowers. And, and they could get Mark Andrews back and likely has stepped up big time for them in the tight end position. So, yeah, Baltimore is the number one in the AFC. They deserve it right now. That Monday night game is going to be so juicy a week from tonight. Tonight's Monday night game should be good. I'll take the Eagles tonight. But a week from tonight, Baltimore at San Francisco. That's a legitimate Super Bowl preview. Absolutely. 100%. That's going to be a very exciting one. Uh, and, you know, I, I also take the Eagles tonight. I agree with you on that one. Uh, I think they uh, 
bounce kind of get put themselves but yeah they the, they're the due Cowboys for the bounce back losing they're, they're, last night was enough motivation for them to make sure they they win this game like yeah I, I really think that's one of those things that that can't be understated enough no not at all not at all so uh that was a fun week 15 recap we've got some clinchers and uh we we still have uh, the rest of the playoff picture the playoff field to fill out which probably won't uh you know be official until week 18 as it normally is so uh, looking forward to these final three weeks of the regular season. We are moving right along as we approach uh, the 2023 NFL postseason, which is crazy and, and wild and fun. Uh, please, uh, you know, follow the podcast network for frequency sake. Uh, we've got a lot of great shows that will be uh, obviously staying in tune with not only the fantasy playoffs, but the actual NFL playoffs here um, as well. Uh, like and subscribe, as always, uh, on YouTube or wherever you may be listening to this podcast. Appreciate the support. For Mark, I'm Dan. This has been the Football Lounge with Mark and Dan. We'll see you back here pretty soon as we look forward to our Week 16 recap and also our Thursday night recap coming up later this week as well. Take care. 